So as, you, as uh, Maria had, had pointed out, there are some really interesting problems going on here. And I'm going to try to give you a, an overview on a little bit of the technical side. And so <clears throat> what I want to do is give you some basis to give you some quantitative analysis. Because eventually any cooperation is going to be required um, to be something that's win-win. And if we follow the hydro diplomacy of Suskind and Siddiqui, who have written this book, um, you, both parties have to win for an agreement to happen. And we have to, we have to show that. And so numbers are needed because right now, both sides' numbers are one is on Mars and one is on Venus. And it's part of negotiations, but they're so far apart, it's leading to, to mistrust. And that's one of the problems that um, Maria has, has when she goes, is you quote a number and they say, no, it's not that, it's a negative sign and not a positive. So international people are getting involved in that. Um, and I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to learn, and, and I'm gonna work on that with you today, learn a little bit about hydrology and a little bit about hydropower engineering. Just enough to know it, but that's what I spend my life. I teach at the, the Kennedy School teaching public policy people about technology. Um, and so we'll try to do this. So this is, Maria pointed it out a little bit before. This is the key aspect of the Nile. And this is the White Nile after it leads the world famous Sud of South Sudan where the Jongli Canal was, was going to be built. And that's really important, but we're not gonna talk about that today. There are two issues here. We are facing a crisis because within 12 months, Ethiopia can start filling the GERD. And according to Egypt, that will viol violate international law and can lead to armed conflict. President Morsi, um, before leaving, threatened armed conflict um, that he would blow up the dam. There are many quotes and things about that. So there has been saber rattling, very loud about this. So it is a crisis because we don't know what Ethiopia, Egypt's going to do, and you'll see that. So it's happening right away, so you understand. However, hopefully WIDA will invite us back because we're gonna use these tools to look at the long-term regional development. Since we are economic development, there are some really strong issues about what Sudan does, because Sudan, in economics terms is a huge free rider in this situation because the GERD is gonna be built here. There is not many good sites for dams in Sudan. So the fact that GERD's gonna be built um, is going to help Sudan in a big way that really threatens Egypt. And so that's a bigger issue right now. But for right now, it's about the filling of the GERD. So we have right here the White Nile, and the White Nile flows very evenly out of the soot. It acts like a big damp, dampening agent, and it loses a lot of water. But you get here at, the, um, at Khartoum, uh, from the Blue Nile, you get about 26 uh, units, which are billion, kilometers cubed or billion cubic meters of water. 26 arrives from the Blue Nile, and it's pretty constant over the year. The big thing here is the source of the, the, the Blue Nile, and also the Danube is called blue. It's something about brown rivers that they call blue. And, and there, there's no reason we think it was the uh, Strauss just thought it looked blue, but um, from the mountaintop. Um, but this is the way the water flows on the Blue Nile. It's basically almost zero, very, very little flow up till June, and then comes what's known as the monsoon. Uh, from the intertropical convergence zone, and it rains like crazy, but only on a very small area on the Ethiopian plateau. Very small area. This provides, right here, this little area, the, the entire Nile Basin is 2 million square kilometers. This is about 200,000 square kilometers, maybe 10%, and it provides 80% of the flow that ends up at Cairo. So you want to get this in your head. If you are... Um, the Egyptians say the water's all theirs. Ethiopia is saying we provide 80% of the water falls on our land. Can we have some of it, please? And that's the issue. So you'll notice it comes in this, so it comes gushing down the river and without dams, you can't store it from year to year, which you'll see, and within the year. So dams are, are can be very bad things environmentally and socially. They make people be displaced that can cause environmental damage. 
But without a dam, you cannot take, utilize this water, and we'll see that later. There is another little piece of water here, the Atbara River, that comes from the Ethiopia, and they literally, it's, it's dry. It is dry for like eight months of the year, and then when this monsoon comes up on the plateau, it flows off this way, but it doesn't go into the GERD. And the GERD doesn't get any of the Dindar or the Rashid River here, but out of Lake Tana, flowing this way. And what Maria was talking about is there was a plan for four major dams on the Blue Nile called the Cascade that the World Bank was going to fund, but it would only be funded when Egypt agreed. So I've been working for, we're working for 10 years with the World Bank, trying to get the cooperation. That was what the NBI was all about, to allow for that to happen. But Egypt continued to block it, so there could be no funding. And that's why I think they were surprised when Melish, in a very strong move, said, we will fund it ourselves. So very interesting that that happened. So here comes all of this water. So what ends up at at, at here, this is Dongola, which is right before entering into Egypt, is you have the base flow, we call it, from the White Nile, and that's very, from year to year it's the same, and from month to month, and then we get this very variable part of that, which you'll see in a little while, very variable Blue Nile, and that gets put on top. Now the GERD is going to be right here, right in the midst of affecting this flow of water, and so we want to keep that in mind. The GERD which will be the eighth largest reservoir on Earth, together with the Aswan Dam, which is the third largest. And there is no precedent whatsoever in the world, that's why it's even a bigger crisis, for two major multi-person dams operating on the same system with no agreement for coordination in place. The closest thing to this is in the Colorado River, they, we have the upper Colorado Basin, which has Lake Powell. We have the lower Colorado, which has Lake Mead. It is run by the same organization, the Bureau of Reclamation. The two groups hate each other. <laughs> I helped develop the decision support system that they use. They fight all the time. And they're from the same country. This, most of the time, the same religion. Not the same football teams they like, but <laughs> that causes a problem. And they're fighting. But they have the Supreme Court of the United States, which comes in to mediate. This is disastrous. And so we, this is what Maria was saying. Now, let's look at this, and this is some of the things she, we want to point out. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Let me just go back here to show you something that she mentioned. The Blue Nile here at the source, after it floats, see the border here of the, the, at Daim is, um, it doesn't show up in here, but I'll tell you, this is 48 and here it's 48. So there's actually more water coming in here, but losses. These are the natural flows without doing it. So there's about 48 units coming here, 28 units here, 12 coming here. So you have 84 here at the, um, at the mouth. There's 84 units of water um, coming right here. The height of that the water will fall at the Aswan Dam is about the same amount of water that will fall at the GERD, I mean, the, the height will be the same. But there's a lot more water at the Aswan there's at the GERD, and they went and built a 6,000 megawatt power plant. Any analysis that was done is that will not operate full at 6,000. That will only be during that very strong peaking period. It really should have been somewhere between two and 3,000. Because Egypt runs their power, power plant at the highest, and it's only 2,000 installed capacity. So what you see is, um, one of the things about this dam is in its name. First, what's the first word? Grand. So they were making a point, we want to make something big. But economically, it doesn't make sense to be that big. That's, that's important. Renaissance, it's a renewal of, of Ethiopia. And those two words have really caused a lot of problems because its design was based on grandeur and to renew Ethiopia, which that has caused a lot of problems about cooperation. There is no irrigation to take place with this. This is the biggest thing. I can get you about 30 articles that will say they're going to use this water to irrigate. This is at the plains. The difference between here and here is almost 1,000 meters. Addis is at 8,000 feet, um, and this is about 4,000 feet here. You are not going to pump the water back. This is all mountains. There's no place to irrigate. So the one myth you want to take away is there is no irrigation with this dam. And this is really, it's not going to be consumptive. 
there will be some consumption from the evaporation off the surface, but the evaporation rates there are much less than at, at S1, and about 12 PhD studies have been done and master studies on how you can, between, if you operate them right, you can reduce the total amount of losses and maybe even get more water to Egypt. So there are some things there. But there's no irrigation here. This is really important. Um, the reservoir is going to be 70 billion cubic meters, um, which will be one of the largest. The Aswan Dam is 162. So it's going to be about twice the size, a little more than twice the size of the Aswan. But it will hold 1.4 times the mean annual flow of the Blue Nile, which is 75% of the water going to Egypt. It's a threat to Egypt. But it's only a threat when they fill it and then you're gonna see it's a threat, and if they wanna use it, they can only use it in a bad way, which will harm Ethiopia. So the threat is filling it up, and then, but once it's full, the water's gonna go somewhere, and it's gonna to go to Egypt. So the threat is there. And according to the, to the government, and this summer, and Maria was there in the summer, it's more than 70% complete, and you might not complete it why it fills because you'll see in a picture later how it's built. So again, why is it a crisis? It's this location right here on the border. And Mellish was really a, a quite smart about that. Um, he, one of the things happens if anybody destroys the dam, there's only like 30 kilometers of Ethiopia it will go through. It will be a big problem for Khartoum, not for anything in Ethiopia. The capital will be lost, but no other damages. So again, here is the issue. The Blue Nile's here, and as we were showing you before, is the white, this is what arrives at, at Egypt. The White Nile is the base flow. This is the blue. This is the most significant part of the flow that arrives at, at S1, and then this is the Atbara, which gives you your peak um, between September and uh, August and September. So when the GERD is put in the middle between the flow of the blue, it will end up uh, affecting this, the shape of this curve, but eventually not the volume. It will change the shape to, because they want to release it for hydropower. The other thing just that, that Maria was showing, she showed you a picture of it under construction. The plan is this is the main dam here. This is the spillway if it ever fills up. And this is a very controversial issue here called the saddle dam. This is a dam because this is the main part, but up here, this is where over to to build this, it's holding the last 40% of the storage. It can only be stored by building this dam over here. And this is um, five kilometers long at 30 meters high. It is one of the highest ever built and longest built in the world. And some engineers are worried about the integrity of that. And the Sudanese were, because there's only been a few that were done and the original design was, was very iffy. This water then flows into the, the famous um, Lake Nasser, and this is the, the High Aswan Dam. This is a concrete dam, very thin and high. This is one kilometer at its base. It's clay in the middle, and then it's rock holding up that clay. Again, this is controversial. The World Bank and the US were gonna build it. NASA went socialist. Um, they said, we're not gonna build it anymore, so the Russians funded it. And so you can go study how the Russians cleaned up with the um, sell, getting their payment in uh, bales of cotton at the price of when they built it, and then pro cotton prices went up. So this is the, the, the Aswan Dam here downstream. So we're going to do a quick primer on reservoirs in hydropower. This is the outlet of, this is the High Aswan Dam. This is its hydropower outlet with 20 turbines. This is when they have more water than can be released to the turbine. You can see the, the power of that given the, the pressure that's on its back. And this is a satellite image, which um, Maria alluded to before, that we can now measure. And there's, I know of about 30 papers of measuring the volume of water that is in the reservoir by using satellites. And they're getting really good at doing that. So there's no need to tell us what's in it, we can guess what went out, what went in by the changes in, in the reservoir here. And then the other thing to see, and this is what's really important, this is Egypt's own filling. So the, the, the High Aswan Dam was closed um, in 1968, and then it filled, but then all of a sudden this happened. And this isn't because Ethiopians, it isn't because of Americans, this is Allah. 
This is natural variability. And in 1978, was um, 88, was the lowest on record. And they were one meter from not being able to let water out of the dam, which we'll see in a minute. So there is this variability and in the Nile. And all of you know the story from the Bible and in um, Exodus, Exodus and also from, uh, from, it's in the Quran about Joseph and the seven years of plenty and the seven years, the seven fat cows and the seven skinny cows. And the, that's the periodicity of the Nile. It tends to stay high or stay low and that's natural. And so one of the things that's going on here is Egypt's crying, um, I have great risk caused by you. A lot of that risk is natural and we're looking at the Delta risk. So here's your water resource engineering. In a reservoir, there's something known as the dead storage or inactive zone. And it's the level at which water can't get out. You build it, you have an outlet, but it's not at the bottom, it's up here. And all the water here cannot get out. Once it, it fills up and that's gonna fill up and then, then you get here. Then you have a buffer zone where you keep water in storage just for, the, uh, for severe droughts. And then you work in what's called the conservation zone, which is your active zone. And then you keep some of it at the top, always open to take a flood. So how you operate this. So the, so the Egyptians have a very elaborate system where they build this dynamically depending on the inflows and other things in the state of their system. So it's all modern um, operations research have designed this, but theirs is all based on a flow into the Aswan without the GERD. So they need to be thinking about how to operate to mitigate anything may happen. Right now, they're not revealing that they are, and that's gonna be a problem. So here is the issue at the GERD. The GERD's base is at 500 meters, and right now water is getting out through these diversion outlets, which will be blocked. Then once that's blocked, we're gonna have an outlet here known as the bottom outlet capacities here, two, um, two outlets that can release water, and they're gonna be at the elevation of 542. And what's interesting, it can hold 70, but going from 542 meters up is only holding one billion cubic meters. So if you think about it, it's like a, a triangle, in a valley. So when you go up 42 meters, you still just have a small area that you're holding. So they're gonna fill this, but it's not very much. Then the turbines are 18 meters higher at 560, but you don't wanna run a turbine without good pressure on it. So they can't operate the turbines until the water is at 590. So what the Ethiopians wanna do is they wanna go from 500 to 590 in the most rapid way possible and that's 15 billion cubic meters of water, about um, one fifth of the total volume so that they can start releasing for hydropower. So this is the buffer zone is from here below. This is your dead zone. And then, then you will operate within this zone um, as you operate. So they wanna get here quick and then they, they have to work with this others. And that's where the flexibility is that Kevin had been studying and Kevin has been working as part of this project as well that when she showed that study. Now your next thing, mechanical engineering 101 is hydropower. Hydropower is generated. So the hydropower you generate is a coefficient times the head, which is the pressure on the turbine times the quantity of flow. So your head is the actually measured in feet and it's the elevation between your turbine, which drives the generator, and the top of the water. That causes pressure. If you've ever gone swimming and you go down below, you feel the pressure on your ear. There is a pressure, that, and that's what drives the turbine, and then the amount of water that goes through. So if you, you could have a small amount of water, but a very high head, which they have in some places, get a lot of hydropower, or the Danube River has this in the Rhine River, um, and others, they have low head, but so much water, they get lots of hydropower. So it's H times Q. So what you wanna do, if you're trying to make money from hydropower, is keep this head as high as you can. So what this means is there's not a lot of active storage. So this is saying Ethiopia in the long run wants to keep the reservoir as full as possible. So once you're full, you just wanna send everything through because you'll have your head. So that's really important to understand that it's in Egypt's interest for it to fill fast and then operate because Ethiopia wants a high head and they want that water through. So this is the issue. So, but if for some reason the water's down low, they wanna fill it back up. So 
So assessing the impact of the GERD in light of the uncertainty of future Nile flows, the, the, we'll look at it in a minute, but we don't know what the flow is going to be over the 5, 10, 15 years of filling. So the risk to Egypt is unknown. It's an uncertain process, a stochastic process, and the sequence will be uncertain and it's stochastic. We need to take a risk-based approach. So we take a modeling framework that we develop, which is using Monte Carlo modeling to look at the risk, generating sequences of the future which will run through uh, the system. So we can look at this. So um, Paul Block, who is at um, the University of Color, uh, University of Nebraska, um, Nebraska, he loves Nebraska. <laughs> He's from Nebraska, at Wisconsin now, and he helped develop that curve that you saw before in Ethiopia on his master's work was funded by IFBRI. We were looking at variability in risk in um, Ethiopian agriculture. This is, for those who are really nerds, this is power spectrum wavelet analysis. And what it shows is they looked at the, the last hundred years of precipitation over the Blue, Blue Nile, and you can actually see that it has different components. And this is very nerdy, but there's a 35 year and a 21 year, and then there are some sub components. So using that, Paul was able to build a model, and this is his model of the last hundred years. And the model does very well in replicating the statistics of the last hundred years. So advanced stuff. So then what we've done is he went up to here, and the code has come out a little bit, but then to go forward, he then just used the model and generated 100 sequences for the next 20 years. Now, one of the important things here, which I'll be a little nerdy because we have economists in the room who love math, is that some people have been doing forward here, just assuming that any one of these years of any period could happen and then just randomly sampling for the future. What Paul said is that there is a long-term trend, and you can see it right here, and this is not good. The trend is showing that for the next 20 years, we're on the downward cycle. So we could have been here and been on an upward cycle. That would be good, but we are, we're relatively in the middle of normal conditions right now at the end of the, in, in 2015, and the model with history would suggest that we're going to, as a mean, be going down, but then we could have events on either side. Famous paper by Mendelbroth, who did fractal, called the Noah and Joseph effect in hydrology, which is right here. You can have a very high effect, big effect, but then also get the periodicity. So that model was, was generated, and we then took those, ran them through a modeling system, and the modeling system we're using is the NBI's modeling system called Mike Hydro. The interesting thing now is $200 million was spent. They built the Nile Decision Support System, a modeling system built by experts from the Nile Basin, for the Nile Basin, and nobody uses it now. Ethiopia won't accept it, Sudan won't accept it, and Egypt won't accept it, but I will. <laughs> and so one of my, my students is running this, and we've worked with, it's now based in Kampala in the headquarters secretariat, and they've shared this with us. So all of this work, we put it through because we believe in the NBI. We believe that is the mechanism for bringing information because it is Nile Basin experts that we would hire anywhere in the world. They're world class sitting there. Let's use their tool, um, and, it, and it has been vetted and objective. So what we ran through here was a filling policy, and you can have 100 different filling policies. And, and Kevin was looking in that report of different minimum flows. What we did, and this is the with NBI, what, what we wanted to look at, is we said there would be a minimum release of 90 billion cubic meters per year. And that's the equivalent of the 95% exceedance, which would be the one in 20 year drought. So we're saying that we're gonna send, we're gonna guarantee to Egypt that they get at least the one in 20 year flow. Uh, what will happen is once it's full, Ethiopia wants to send them all the water. And then we're gonna look at four different um, filling uh, rates. One where we can fill it as fast as we can, unconstrained. The other is we, we can't get, we fill in three years, five years, and 10 years. And this is an example of one, one, three different scenarios, one fl inflow sequence. If you fill it slowly, and remember from my outflow, hydropower is H times Q. So the head, so this is literally related to the head, you get lower and lower hydropower 
as you wait to do this. So you're sending your water through, but you're not getting as much hydropower. So each, the lower this curve, there is an economic loss to Ethiopia if they slow down here. But the key thing for Egypt is what are the impacts? So is it worth it for Ethiopia to take this loss for gains in Egypt? And that's what we're trying to look at. So these are 117 um, year sequences going into the GERD. So we call that our spaghetti diagram. And it's hard to see what that means, but I'll try for you. So actually there's a trace here of the blue that's showing, trying to mimic what we would think is happening. So where we're, we're preserving intercorrelation, lag one correlation, all these nice uh, statistical time series properties. But this is a summary of it. So at each year we have a box and whisker. This is the median. And so again, you see this is the trend and, and it's can, trending to go down a little bit. That's that long-term 35-year signal that um, uh, Professor Block showed. Maybe that's him calling now. <laughs> and then if you're aware of box and whisker, that's the 50 percentile of that spaghetti. And then these are the um, extreme points. And in MATLAB, their program says, if I don't believe that this extreme point, I'll give you it as an outlier saying, uh, this, this makes sense that they're all in here. This, so they, they highlight these that they could potentially be, be there. So what you see is the flow coming into the GERD. Remember we said 30 was the release. Historically, we, I mean, we can get without the GERD less than 30 coming because there's no dam to store for it. And we can get some high flows. And we said before about 50 is the mean. And sure enough, we see that over all the years, it maintains that. So what does this mean for GERD storage? This is unconstrained storage. This is unconstrained. This is the um, filling it with um, 10 years. And what you see here with unconstrained, it rapidly gets, it gets to about 30 in about four years. Here to get to 30 takes, um, this is with three year filling. And then for here to get to 30 takes almost um, 11 years. So there's an impact on Ethiopia um, because of that, but we see again, there is a wide range of uncertainty because it depends on exactly which flow comes in. So if we summarize all of that and say, what is the mean storage over 10 years? What we're seeing with no GERD, no storage. That's a nice, easy plot. And then here is, if there's no policy, mean fill as fast as you can, the average storage over the first 10 years is about 38 billion. If you do it in three years, you get about 26. If you do it in five years, you get about 22. And if you take 10 years, you're down at about 20. So this is in the mean over a 10 year period, you actually are bringing a, an impact on Ethiopia in its mean value of producing hydropower as a result of that. The interesting thing for Ethiopia is that the, the minimum level or the worst case situation is about the same everywhere. But in terms of what you're getting in the mean um, it's definitely dropping. So there is an impact in each of these techniques. If we look at the release that's going to, to um, Ethiopia, uh, going to Egypt at the border of Ethiopia, which is all they can control, here is, again, this is this natural inflow, and this is the release for no policy, this is release with three year, and this is the release with 10 year. The one thing I want you to notice is here's 30. There are about six or seven um, releases below 30, with natural flows. When you look at even the no policy, oh, this didn't come off, there is none. There are no releases under 30. So the GERD is actually providing to Egypt more water at the low end than they would have naturally. It's cutting off some of that because the, the reservoir storage is letting it release when there isn't water. So it is good for Egypt um, for the GERD at the low end here. And so if we look at these release policies with the, the average release is about 52. With no policy, it falls to 46. And then five years, it goes up a little bit. And 10 years, and this is looking over that, because they're releasing water rather than storing it. So what happens to Egypt? So these are the impacts of the inflows to Egypt. If you don't have the GERD, we have 74 like we showed um, before. We then have no policy which is bringing it down to about uh, 67. We have our three year, our five year, and our 10 year. So the interesting thing is there, when you put the GERD in, there is an impact, significant impact of about seven or eight 
BC, um, BCM going in. And then though, however you fill slow or, or, as, or fast or slow, there's very little impact on the bottom and then on the medians here uh, going into that. And that's a mixture of both what's coming out of the GERD and what the at Barra and the White Nile are doing. And then these are the impacts on storage, which will affect hydropower. And then here are the impacts on hydropower. So what we see here is, here is the condition with, with no GERD. And then with the GERD, there is a reducing um, of the mean annual um, flows here. And at this point, we have um, the, the standard um, whisker here is about the same. But what we see, and we'll come back to that, with the GERD, there are some significant extreme events that happen through an, with a number of these by having the GERD in place. There is one that happens without the GERD, but there are now a, two, two more each um, in this, which is a 2% increase in and lower of a very bad or extreme event. So we see on average we have an impact, and then here some extremes. So what we wanted to do is say there is a trade-off then. How much is Ethiopia impacted by a slower filling? And we see, let's take the average. This is um, with, with no GERD, there's no hydropower. If we build the GERD with no policy, we're getting about 1,200. The three-year filling, it's about 1,198. Five-year drops to <coughs> about uh, 10,900. 10, and then here at the 10-year, it drops closer to 1,050. So there is an economic cost to Ethiopia to slow down the filling um, and still provide that. So what is the value of GERD hydropower. The average annual generation for a minimum release of 30 BCM is 11,000 gigawatt hours. If you assume one cent per gigawatt hour, and this is controversial, recently um, e uh, Kenya was buying in the East African power pool at 14 cents per kilowatt hour. So it's potential if they were connected, they could get it. Um, we've seen seven mentioned. So we just use 10 here because it's easy to do the math. You put a one and one and move over a couple of zeros. But basically you could do it. That's on average 1.1 billion. Now, there are some that are say, trying to use this number. So that's what you're getting as a revenue from the GERD. If oh, you're getting 11,000, you get a billion dollars a year. Um, the cost of the GERD is between four and six billion. So with, a, with depending on your discount rate, it's going to have a BC ratio greater than one. But it isn't a huge one. That's really expensive. Hydropower is much more expensive than thermal stations, about 3,000 per kilowatt hour. Um, the previously, we were looking just at engineering indicators. What if we then look at our economic indicators? So we're using a technique and a methodology developed here at WIDER, which was headed by, by Channing along with um, James Thurlow. And it's called the, the sacred framework, where we go from climate through biophysical and engineering and infrastructure models into an economy wide model. And so we've learned on how to link the channels of an economy to these things like how does hydropower get in into the model so we can do that. And we've learned, so we've had to grow in terms of how the eco e economy looks at things, but then reporting to the, the economic model, the things that matter from these biophysical. So using this framework, we developed a model of the, the system. This is the, the, the schematic going into a, and, and this is just how we operate, the hydropower, which goes into a computable general equilibrium model of the Egyptian economy, and which has then water is involved. And taking these outputs, we're able to look now at the effect on GDP. So to give you a, a sense of Egypt in 2013, it was about 272 billion uh, US dollars. The population, 82 million growth rate of about 2.1, but a GDP per capita about 3,300 in Egypt, but a very um, poor um, Gini factor in this. So it's grown quite a bit, but I mean, so what we did is because we couldn't run a hundred of these models, we, we sampled the 5%, the 25%, the 50%, the 75 and the 95% of this. And this is this unconstraint, the one that would um, do the best for, for, um, for Ethiopia. And if we were to take this unconstrained 
uh, version, what we would get in the 5% or the worst case is about a 0.12 um, impact on the, on the GDP. And that's about $300 million. That's quite a bit here. But the median, if we look at the mean, is about 0.04. And this is the unconstrained. So if the, Egyptian, if the Ethiopian says, all right, I'm going to go with a three-year filling, we immediately drop this to about 0.03%. These are not percentages, 0.03%, less than one. And on average, it's at about 2% of the impact of, of no GERD on, on Egypt. So there is a benefit from the point of view of the economy, um, and this is particularly got to do with the irrigation side, which we didn't spend a lot of time on. So we can save a lot in economic terms by going to a three-year fill. And we showed before, there's not a big impact in there. Now, where, where are these? So if we look at this, what you see is these impacts to the economy wide are here. What's interesting is, what is the impact on the ag GDP? And we see here, it's almost double, more than double. So the ag is feeling this hit because the way they're keeping the hydropower up is, is having an impact on the uh, releases which are affecting the irrigation. And again, under the unconstrained, it's very dramatic. And at the mean, it's at 0.1. And so again, this is agriculture. And we'll see why we're talking about that again. And then here is impact on wages. So if we look at this, we see the effect on wages are very strong. These are the um, rural, the poorest rural R1s, which are gonna be irrigated uh, that work on the farms. This is R5, this is the richest rural. They're not quite as affected, but they're usually in agro industries, but more on the industry side. And this is the urban impact on poor urban and impact on um, rich urban, so the quantiles. So why are we focusing so much on ag in that? Direct quote from the minister, and I think you may concur, is there is a culture and psyche of the farmers, which are 60% of the employees, of Egypt, that the Nile is there, and if you take the Nile, it's going to kill them. And the government is very concerned, not about gross GDP, but about the impact to farmers. And with the, all the unrest that's gone on, and the, the farmers are very strongly engaged with the Muslim Brotherhood and supported them. So they are worried that any, any impact to Egypt that was perceived, if not real, but if it's felt by the farmers, then that impact is going to lead to instability. So they are very concerned, um, not about just general GDP, which might be small, but this impact on ag, and particularly the wages of the, of the poorest, which would mobilize quickly, and those are the ones that are hurt the worst. But again, this is what I'm talking about. This is the 5% amount. If we're looking at the medians, here, it's not quite as dramatic, and Ethiopia has a chance to mitigate some of this if they would go to a three-year filling policy. So what's the deal on the average? Well, on the average, the loss of hydropower at the High Aswan Dam will be about 1,400 gigawatts. What, what does that mean? Well, that loss turns out to be about $30 million under the no constraint um, down to about 17 under the nine, seven year fill. That's what we, we were seeing that biggest impact with no constraint in three years. Look what happens here. The gain of bringing the GERD on, you're going from zero to $1.1 billion in revenue. Now, you gotta pay back for that, so the net is not quite as high. But if you think of it as sunk costs, it's kind of sunk costs building the GERD. This is how many times? About a thousand, you know, 100 times, 300 times, this is the cost. Egypt's losing $30 million. This is just an ag. When you add the ag, it gets bigger, so it's substantially more. But just in hydropower alone, that if the GERD gave its lost hydropower to, to, to Egypt, this amount, they'd be still getting a net 90% of their output. So there is a room for compensation with this because it's such a huge differential between it. And, but there are other losses to the farmers and that gets a little bit more tricky on what you do because you can't make up water. So, but then what we said is if we look at this, these, these mean values, there's not a big difference and we can deal with it. This is the problem here. The problem's not above the problems here. 
And we Egyptians are some of the most risk averse people in the world. We did a study on the value of the high as one dam to its economy. It's about 1% GDP. Using risk, um, um, risk assessment um, and, and risk aversion techniques, the Bernoulli approach, it doubles the value to, of the Egyptians of the dam because you've taken the variability out of the, out of the flow. So Egyptian risk aversion is very, very high. They do not like extreme events. So it's these things that are worrying them in principle, this we think we could work out. There are political reasons we'll get to in a minute why this may be difficult. But this is a real reason that policymakers and people are worried about is, is if this happens, it's disastrous for them psychologically and politically. So the risk to Egypt of GERD filling, loss of hydropower and irrigation flow. On average, these are small and are much less than the gain at the GERD. So that leads us to cooperative game theory or some way of cooperating. However, there is significant increase in the risk of extreme impacts. The Egyptian, the economy wide <coughs> impacts are minor, but in, in what's happening is that why the economy wide impacts are less than the pure impacts is the limited role of water in the GDP now. Ag is 11% of GDP, and the High House One Dam is now only 10% of total generation. By 2030, it'll be 2% of total, and Ag GDP is going to be down to about 2%. So as we move forward, the Nile's less and less important in the, in the conflict with Ethiopia is less. But this is a huge bus, and this is somewhat summarizing what Maria had said. Impacts are on low income and farmers, which are a very politically volatile segment of the Egyptian economy. So we're seeing with our model, those are where the impacts are coming, the, the worst case for the policymakers. There is a poor society-wide understanding of the greatly reduced role of the, that the Nile plays in the Egyptian economy. You just ask them, oh, our economy will die. If we were to shut off the Nile tomorrow, it's 11% of GDP and 10% of any, you could substitute, it would hurt, but they'd say we would all be dying, it would be a disaster, they, they understood. But more importantly, the, the incredible role that the Nile plays in national identity, psyche, and pride is unbelievable, and that's something not easily educated and changed. So is there room for cooperation in a system like that? Well, what are the risks to Ethiopia? There's loss of hydropower revenues and repayments if they change the policy a little, but they're minor. And it would cause somewhat of a slowing to economic growth. We're not considering about not building at all. It's operating to really rank down any impacts on Egypt. The GERD has been um, significantly funded by domestic bonds. And so there is a society-wide understanding of an inflated role the GERD will play on the Ethiopian economy. To get people to buy the bonds, they've oversold them. So they think if the GERD doesn't produce at 100% of its power, we're going to hurt e Ethiopian growth. Then, the, So again, they have, again, the incredible role of the GERD now plays in national identity, psyche, and pride. Just look at the name, Grand Ethiopian, Ren Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. It's just in the name. Is there room for cooperation? So we have a proposal, and I asked Maria, and then maybe you can come in. Could we develop a, a hybrid where the international community comes to together to develop an insurance scheme similar to what's already in place? So this is a new, called the Hydrologic Risk Fund, which is on the Senegal River, or crop insurances that we see now that would come into force when either Egypt or Ethiopia are put in an extreme place. It may be a big cost that they're facing, but because the probability is so low, the premium should be low. And if these premiums could be funded even by the international community to avoid conflict, um, it would then allow that both Egypt and Ethiopia, they, they would be insured against those losses from the extreme event. And it's my theory, it would allow them to develop an agreement based on the clear win-win of the mean state of the Nile, the boxes of the box and whisker. Those boxes are doable win-win collaborations. When you worry about the extremes, that's when you freak out both psychologically and there's no way that Ethiopia could guarantee or Egypt can accept. But if we cut those tails off with some insurance schemes, then maybe we can get them to cooperate and look beyond this incredibly um, institutional and psychological barrier. The, the, the technology is there. We can get 
oh, we can get the best OR people in the world to build optimization models that will link those two things, make them run 10 times better than alone. There's no problem. There's the economics that show we can share the benefits there, but can we make it institutionally that you've been fighting? And what do you think of some kind of proposal like this? Yeah, that was really interesting.